all right we are up and running so what are we doing today we are going to be talking about the uh, design procedure for finite state machines so the the lecture today is going to be fsm design before we get into the lecture let us take a look at some uh, announcements one daily quiz number 22 is available on great scope please go ahead and answer the questions that are available before midnight tonight um, I I was really glad to see that you guys turned things around. Uh, in the last class, there were over a hundred submissions, uh, so that that was very good to see that you guys have uh, sort of um, you know uh, taken that a bit more seriously. And I I I hope that we have more than hundred submissions for every class from now to the end of the semester. We just have four lectures. One of them is today. So there will be three more. Um, okay, so what is today? Today is Tuesday, April 20th. Homework 11 is due tonight. Homework 12 has been posted and is due uh, next Tuesday, Tuesday, April 27th. Studio 7 is due April 21st, so that's tomorrow. Uh, you can also use the help sessions tonight from 6 to 8 and 8 to 10 uh, Eastern Time to get checked off and submit your studios. Um, and I want to you know, stress upon the fact that uh, you, you, you guys wanna go and check whether you were added to the studio submissions or not. Um, so make sure, it, so after the grades are signed, it'll be too late. So this is the time where you make sure that all your submissions um, are uh, are there and have been graded and they have got the appropriate score. Now is the time to think about that. Um, studio 8, your last studio is also posted and it's due April 28th. Uh, but if you are able to finish that ahead of time and get checked off, that's good as well. All right, so there have been some questions regarding homework. Uh, yes, that is the last studio. We don't have any more Wednesdays left. Um, but if you guys are, you know, interested in, um, you know, uh, getting some ideas to work on some FPGA related projects over the summer break, please contact me uh, after the finals week and I'll be able to, you know, uh, give you some ideas to work on uh, for the summer if you're interested in, you know, learning things um, uh, that are in that domain, uh, PhDL programming, programming things. Uh, you know, uh, some cool applications. Uh, let me know if you're interested after finals week. Uh, after finals week. Okay, so I guess that is it. Oh, uh, question about the, the homework. Homework 11 is due tonight because we did not uh, spend too much time talking about the design process, which uh, is involved in homework 11. Uh, what if we say we are right now? What do you mean? What, what do you say? Oh yeah, so, uh, well, not right now, because I don't want to give you guys uh, more work uh, than whatever you have on your plate. Get through your courses, get done with finals, and then you can look for summer projects. But I'm glad to see that you're interested, that's nice. Keep that interest alive. Uh, all right, so let's get into uh, lecture number 14. Uh, so let's scratch this out. This doesn't mean anything right now. Uh, FSM design, right? So we are talking about what is, we talked about the concept, we talked about the two variations in terms of Moore and Mealy finite state machines. Uh, we looked at some uh, basic ideas. Now let's get into uh, all the steps that are involved in finite state machine design. So the design approach relies on these six steps. And some of these might not apply to certain finite state machines because they might be a little bit uh, redundant. But in general, if you're looking at a, a, a new finite state machine that you want to design, these are the six basic steps that you are going to uh, uh, follow, right, in, in, in that uh, order. Um, now, the first one is to understand the statement of the specification. So you read through the problem, try to understand what that finite state machine sup is supposed to do. That's the first step. The second one is to obtain an abstract specification of the FSM. So this could involve maybe drawing a rough sketch of your FSM. Coming up with the 
a state diagram tends to be the most crucial step in your design. So do a, 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 a state assignment and a state minimization. So that's three and four. Can I design this finite state machine in four states instead of 16 states? Um, so that's state minimization. And how do you assign the state? Is, is state zero, what does that correspond to uh, in your machine? What does state one correspond to in your machine? So those, uh, those steps, as long as you get to the state transition diagram or simply the state diagram tend to be the most sort of crucial steps where you need to be a little bit more creative, you need to put in some thought about how do you minimize states and so on. But once you get to the state diagram, step number five and six is going to be pretty straightforward because it's going to rely on the same sort of uh, sequence of steps, choosing flip-flops to Im uh, implement your uh, FSM. It's gonna be pretty straightforward. Choose a, you know, you're gonna come up with a state transition table, uh, based on your state diagram, which is very straightforward, then from your state transition diagram, you will do a symbolic first, and then you will do an encoded state transition table next, which will have certain columns, right? So for example, you will have present state, input, next state, output. And then you will use some logic equations that you may be using KMAPs to derive, and then you will finally implement the finite state machine, which is to uh, essentially sketch out all the, the FSM circuit. So five and six is supposed to be sort of a plug and chug, go through the process uh, steps. Um, not too difficult if you're, if you're doing, if you're being careful about entering things into a K-map, simplifying the K-map appropriately and so on. But three and four is, is going to be a little bit more crucial uh, because that's where everybody is sort of taking their own approach to the design process. So the first example we'll do is the same vending machine example that we did in the previous one, uh, previous FSM concept lecture, but in this case, we will actually design it completely. So what is this vending machine FSM supposed to do? It is supposed to deliver a pack of gum that costs after uh, 15 cents. So the vending machine, if it gets 15 cents, deposit it in a single coin slot, then it vends that pack of gum. And it is going to take dimes and nickels and it's not going to give you any change back. So this is the same uh, vending machine problem that we had looked earlier uh, in the previous previous uh, previous lectures. So step number one is to understand the problem. And like I said, this could involve, and in some cases, block diagram may not be necessary. In this case, we are choosing to go and explore each and every step. So the first one is to draw a picture. Our vending machine, finite state machine, is right in the middle and it has certain flip-flops. So that is, a, a clock is an input to the vending machine. Then there is a coin sensor, single slot coin sensor, that is detecting whether the user inputs a nickel or they input a dime or the user is resetting the vending machine, those are the three options the user has. So that's sort of your inputs, nickel, dime, or reset to bring it to the initialization state where there is no money in the vending machine. Now, and then in terms of outputs of the vending machine, there is only one. Do you want to open this gum release mechanism or you don't want it to open, right? That's it, open or not. So after you draw this picture, you at least have an understanding of, okay, here is where my uh, uh, sequential elements are going to go. Here is a coin sensor. You have two inputs in terms of nickel and dime, and you have one output, right? So that's kind of what you get. Now this becomes very important as you, the number of inputs and outputs increase uh, in your FSM. That's step one. Step two, like I said, step two, three, four are, are going to be a little bit uh, uh, more intense just because you need to think your way through the statements that are laid in front of you. So second step is to map into more suitable abstract representation. And what helps you to do this is to tabulate typical input sequences first. So how can I do this? Well, the user may um, 
uh, enter three nickels to get the pack of gum or they may they may enter nickel and dime or in the reverse order dime and nickel or they may enter two dimes or they may enter two dimes and then followed by a nickel right so all of these are sort of typical input sequences the user may go through to get to a pack of gum and you, we are again you're going to be using nickel as n uh, the, the, the the input variable n and for dime we can use d. So once you tabulate this, you can start working on the state diagram which is shown on the left. So what do we have here? We have a reset input that initializes things and puts the vending machine in state zero, s zero. Then from state zero, in fact from every state that is going to be in the FSM, there are going to be two possibilities. The user may enter a nickel or the user may enter a dime. So from S0, there are two arrows coming out, one corresponding to what would happen if it and if the user is entering a nickel, what would happen if the user enters a dime. So from S0, you go to S1, in which you have say, what is S1? S1 is essentially saying, I have five cents in the vending machine. S2 is saying I have 10 cents in my, in my vending machine. State zero is I have zero cents in my vending machine. Once you do that, again, all of this is what you're doing in terms of completely tabulating input sequences that are desired, right? So for example, how do you go from S0 to an open state? Well, you can do a nickel followed by a dime. That's when you open. Or you could do S0, dime, then nickel, S5. That's when you open and so on. Um, uh, now, before we go uh, any further, let me talk to you about what kind of FSM is this? What type? What type are we designing here? Moore, absolutely right. So this is a Moore machine because the output open is associated with the state. So that what it means in terms of a real machine is when the, the user enters a coin, that's not when, you know, that, that's, that's not the exact time for the gum release mechanism to open. It is going to wait for that next active clock edge so that it can transition to the next state and then that's what is going to open, right? So that that's sort of the difference there. Um, Andrew says S8 output should slap the user. <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> and perhaps, or perhaps the user doesn't know that there is no change. <laughs> well, yeah, because nickel, nickel, and it could enter a dime, right? But then, then they. If they had a nickel and a dime, sure, that's right. If they have a nickel and a dime, then just do that. You are right. But we are trying to, um, you know, design something that is, uh, you know, that is focused on the, the the design of the machine, not as far as, you know, taking care of uh, whether the user is stupid or not. Uh, so so they, they might make... Uh, certain choices that uh, the machine doesn't need to judge them. So we are not judging the user here. All right, so let's go back to this. Uh, our inputs are what? Nickel, dime, or reset. From any state, if you hit a reset, you go to state zero. And the user most likely should not be doing this because they are essentially losing all the money that they have entered. There's no change area in this. Um, Shini says, this is why human-centered designs a whole major. That's right, yeah. Um, all right, so let's see. From state zero, you've got two arrows, nickel and dime. You go to state one or state two, respectively. Then from state one, we are still not opening the gum release mechanism. Again, two possibilities, nickel and dime. State three, don't open it yet. State four, you have got 15 cents, so you can open. From state three, you have not yet opened it. You could get another nickel or dime in state seven and in state eight, both of them, you open the release mechanism. You're not you're not sort of doing any output 
that gives the change back. That, that output is not being considered for this FSM. Now, in the other side of the tree, you have state two. So far you have got 10 uh, cents in your machine. From state two, you could go to state five if the user enters a nickel and you could go to state six if the user enters a dime. So on the arcs or on the arrows, you have inputs. Inside the state, you have the outputs. Well, in this case, just one output open. And then you have the state assignment is sort of arbitrary right now. We are right now using symbols for the states. State zero, state one, state two, all of those are simply uh, the, the state names but we have not associated any kind of um, amount, money with those states. We could do that. We could do that in our state minimization step. So we have mapped things into suitable abstract representations. We have drawn the state diagram, but this is not, you know, uh, the, the final state diagram. This is essentially to give you a, a sense of how things are gonna start and maybe end. Uh, let's see, actually in this situation, it would make sense for S8 to give back five cents and you wouldn't have to worry about not having a change or anything because you're guaranteed to have X, an extra nickel. Yeah, that's right. So you could, you could make certain, you know, actually not certain, a lot of changes to this vending machine uh, to make it more realistic, right? So we can add on more functionality to this, but the way we are starting off with this is to keep things simple, only one output. But you're absolutely right. There could be another output uh, for, for vending the, the giving back the change to the user. Okay, so in step number three, we work on state minimization. So instead of using state zero, state one, state two, state three, and so on, all the way to state eight, uh, by the way, if we, implemented this FSM as is, how many flip-flops would you need if we did it just as is? Number of flip-flops, uh, three or four, zero through eight, four, right? So you've got zero, state zero, all the way to state eight. So that is nine states, that's right, nine states, so if I was using three flip-flops, I could go only up to eight. I need to go uh, one more state, so I need four flip-flops. But when, I when I'm using four flip-flops, uh, I, I don't really care about, uh, you know, states nine through 15, because they are not part of my diagram. So I could have used four flip-flops to, to get this done with nine states, but Step number three is, can you minimize the number of states? And sure, we can. The reason is, we have talked about the fact that the vending machine really is concerned about how much money does it currently have. And no matter what path you follow, state zero, one, four, or you do state zero, two, five, or you do state zero, one, three, eight, no matter what path you follow, there are only going to be four possibilities for the states as in terms of how much money does your vending machine have? Zero cents, five cents, 10 cents, and 15 cents. So now you can condense your state diagram to only have four states. So the job now can be done with only two flip-flops, right? So this is just two flip-flops. Flip-flops count equals two. And those flip-flops could be could be D flip-flops, could be toggle flip-flops, could be JK flip-flop, or whatever you want to choose as your uh, uh, flip-flop choice. Uh, typically for final state machines, you do you choose a data flip-flop, a D flip-flop, uh, just because things uh, become uh, pretty easy. Is that what we are learning today? Uh, what do you mean? the design of it. Well, not the design of just the vending machine, uh, but I'll be talking about, uh, you know, more examples. But yes, we are focusing on the design, FSM design. So you've got the state minimization, uh, state table, right? So this is your sort of minimized state transition table. Reset, you come to zero cents. From zero cents, nickel or dime. 
from 5 cents nickel or dime from 10 cents nickel or dime both take you to 15 cents where you open again this is also a Moore machine but we have reduced the number of states from 9 to 4 thereby decreasing the number of flip-flops that you need from 4 to 2 because we have reused the states right whenever possible you reuse the state for example 10 cents right the machine has 10 cents over here is one state but in the earlier we were using state 3 to indicate the same thing as S2, right? S2 was 10 cents, S3 was also 10 cents. So we have, we have sort of con condensed the number of states by reusing them in our state machine, uh, state diagram. Now, once you get to your minimized state transition diagram, after that, things are going to be very straightforward. At least I, I hope that you guys see that coming up with the state transition diagram is tricky. But once you get there, after that, things are going to flow because it's going to be the same process. You have four essential columns, present state inputs, next state output. Present state, well, it could be 0, 5, 10, or 15. So you have got 0 cents, 5 cents, 10 cents, and 15 cents as your four states. And because I'm using 0, 5 cents, 10 cents, and 15 cents, as opposed to zeros and ones, I'm calling it a symbolic state table or symbolic state transition table. From each present state, there are four of them, I could have the inputs as no nickel, no dime, what is your next state? No dime, but you the user entered a nickel, where do you go? One di uh, a dime, but no nickel, where do you go? Both Put both of them at the same time, don't care. Why do I have it as don't care? Why do I have this as don't care? Uh, impossible because only one coin slot, right? So I have, I have sort of taken care of that possibility that there was uh, there was only one coin slot so the user doesn't care about this now this don't care is going to later on help me uh, in k maps because that's going to sort of help me uh, get to a, a very simple equation at the end right um, let me talk a little bit more about this situation i'm going to highlight it and let's say you have a nickel or dime, right? Suppose you had two coin slots. How feasible, how realistic is it going to be to for, for us to, to monitor this particular state in which your inputs are 1, 1? Suppose you had two coin slots, right? So even if you have two coin slots, is it really possible for a user to enter two coins exactly at the same time it's going to be very difficult to do that right one input might get counted a little bit before the other input unless they are a machine yeah so everything is sort of getting uh, clocked by a common clock which is much faster than any input uh, being given to the to the machine uh, what if they are built on a machine to pull that's right. So, but but then that is not what we are talking about here, right? We are talking about a user, a human in, uh, interaction with a machine. So, so I'm talking about that scenario here. So if there is friction, would get into the way I would. Yeah, sure, absolutely. There are some special cases in which accidentally there might be it might be possible. But I'm trying to convey that it is going to be difficult to time it exactly, right? Because it is also going to depend on how fast the clock is. If the clock is very, very, very fast, say in tens or hundreds of megahertz or even some uh, a few gigahertz, then it would be difficult for you to time both the dime and the nickel counting at the same time, even if you had two coin slots, right? which essentially means that the user might think that they are entering 
both at the same time, but in fact, it might happen that the dime gets counted first, you go to 10 cents, and from 10 cents, the nickels gets counted and you go to 15. You guys see that? So you, the user might think that, oh yeah, I entered one one, so I'm, I, I am jumping two states at once. But in reality, in the background, what is happening is, let us suppose the dime gets entered first, you go to 10 cents, from 10 cents, the nickel gets counted and you end up in 15, right? So the user is sort of uh, not even realizing this, but those things are going to happen in the background. Uh, I've never seen a vending machine with greater than, uh, uh, this is just for discussion. Uh, now, the reason why I'm talking about these things, these scenarios is because, think about a, uh, a, a finite state machine in which you have two buttons, two buttons functioning as inputs, right? What then? What if the user is trying to press both buttons at the same time, right? So these this discussion is more applicable to that scenario. All right, let let, let me have that discussion later on when we when we talk about uh, that example. And let's go back to this. So from zero cents. There are four possibilities. The user may not enter any coin, may enter a dime, uh, sorry, may enter a nickel, may enter a dime, or one one, which we don't care about because there is only one coin slot. Based on those input criteria, we go to the next state. So from zero to zero, no change. From zero to five, went up by five cents. From zero to 10, went up by a dime and don't care. And during all these times, because we are in the present state zero, no money, we are going to leave the output open. Uh, sorry, uh, we, our output open is zero, which means that we are not releasing the, the pack of gum. Similarly, we go to state five, uh, 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 state called five cents. From five cents, again, those four possibilities exist. We are not gonna, care about one one situation because we are not entering a dime and a nickel at the same time. So that remains as is over here and here as well. So from five cents, don't enter any money, stay there. Enter nickel, go to 10. Enter a dime, go to 15. One one, don't care. During this time, don't release the uh, gum, pack of gum. Uh, how would we add reset? Would you, oh, so there is no reset in this. So the reset is part of the state diagram to indicate that whenever you press a reset, you are going to come to the state zero. So reset input is essentially going to um, work as a reset for a flip-flop. So it is going to make, put all the outputs into a zero state. That is it it is not going to be a part of our state transition table. All right, let's come back to this. Uh, from 10 cents, where can you go? Well, you can stay there. If you don't enter a nickel or dime, you can go to 15 if the user enters a nickel. You stay at 15 if the user enters a dime. Uh, a problem there because, you know, if you have given it more money than needed. And then one one is don't care. Now, if you are in 15, state 15 cents, no matter what the user enters, nickel or dime, we are going to have the next state as 15 cents. That means that you're just staying there. You're not moving forward because we said we are going to need the user to press a reset button to bring it back to zero cents. And we are not giving it any change back. So. 15 cents, if you keep entering the nickel or dime, you are going to just stay at 15 cents. Now, as long as you are in 15 cent state, you are going to have the output open, right? So that's where you are uh, giving the pack of gum to the user. Uh, let me take a few questions in the chat box. Ryan says, then why not have any state, any input at say 15 cents, uh, send the state back, you could. So that is adding more functionality to the vending machine. This is not the best vending machine example that we are looking at. 
right? This is a example that we are looking at. So, so over here we are we are not um, we are not uh, going back to the initial state when the user enters more coins. However, later on we will look at an example in which we do that. We actually go to the initial state if the user continues to enter some input. So that's an, a part of another example. All right. Uh, so let's see. So you open only when you are in 15 cents because you are doing a Moore machine. All right. Questions about how do you go from the the minimized state transition table to a symbolic state transition table? Questions about that? This feels really similar to programming. So, you know, I think the, 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 the issue is this, right? Suppose the first vending machine, finite state machine example that you look at is a complex one. You are going to have a lot of possibilities to consider, right? So all we would do is talk about all those possibilities. Um, and it might uh, end up in being a very, very complex state diagram with a lot of states and a lot of inputs to consider. It would just be something that, uh, you know, um, uh, we, are, we are losing the point there, right? So the point over here is to understand the process of going through this. All right. Looks like you guys don't have questions at this time. So we are at symbolic state transition table. What is going to be the logical next step? Encode it. Yes. Because our flip flops don't understand zero cents. Our flip flops understand zeros and ones. So I'm going to go to a encoded state transition table next. Now in this, I could come up with my own encoding. For example, I can say zero cents, five cents, 10 cents and 15 cents. Those are present states. How many flip flops I need to do I need to use over here, well, we said two earlier. So I need two flip-flops to do this, which means that I can use present state instead of this present state column, I can have a column for present state as Q1 and Q0, or you can have Q1 and Q2, whatever you, you, whatever you want to call those uh, present state outputs of the two flip-flops. Then you can say Q1 and Q0 may be 0, 0 for 0 cents, right? So four of them. And then you can have 0, 1 for 5 cents. And then you can have 1, 0 for the 10 cents. And then you can have 1, 1 for the 15 cents. And based on this assignment, you are also going to change your next state column. How is the next state column going to change? Well, you're going to have Q1 plus and Q0 plus, right? Next state of Q0 is Q0 plus. Next state of Q1 is Q1 plus. But you're going to use the same assignment, zero, uh, zero cents is zero, zero, and so on, right? So zero cents, you would put zero, zero in both the, both the things. Five cents, you would put zero one, and then you would fill out all those possibilities here. Output open is is already uh, coded, uh, encoded. It's it's binary already, so you don't need to worry about that. So that will take us to the encoded state transition table, or state encoding, right? So we said we need two flip flops to do this. So we changed our present state column from just present state to represent the current outputs of the two flip-flops, whatever those flip-flops may be. It looks like we are using D flip-flops, data flip-flops, two of them. So why is this D0 and why did I choose to write Q0 plus over here? 
what, what do you guys think? I chose to write Q0 plus and Q1 plus over here. And over here in this slide, it is written D0 and D1. They are equal, absolutely right. And the reason why they are equal is because of the characteristic equation of a D flip-flop. Q plus equals D, right? That's right, Q plus equals D. So that is sort of the advantage of using a D flip-flop for this design, for such designs because you don't even have to have extra columns, right? Suppose we were doing it um, with toggle flip-flops. If we were doing this with toggle flip-flops, T flip-flops, then we would actually need present state inputs, next state T and output, right? Whatever that is. So based on the entries in present state and next state, you would need to figure out T, right? It could be less efficient though. Absolutely right. It is, it could be uh, more efficient. You meant more efficient, right? It could be more efficient if, you, I, if I use a toggle flip-flop or if I use a JK flip-flop. Absolutely right. It could be more efficient uh, in terms of the number of transistors or number of logic gates that go into my FSM design. Absolutely. It would, uh, there would be a J1, K1, J0, K0 if we use JK for this. That's absolutely right. Uh, so for this, we would, you know, because you have two of them, we need T1 and T0 because there is Q1 plus Q0 plus and Q1 and Q0, right? So based on these, you would get that. And then based on this, you would get that. So sure, you you can do this with JK flip-flops or you can do it with uh, toggle flip-flops or you can do it with D flip-flop. Again, there is no one general rule, right? This flip-flop is the best. There's no general rule like that. It depends on the type of transitions that are happening. Suppose you were trying to go for a counter, toggle flip-flops are best. Registers, D flip-flops are best. You know, it, 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 it is a stretch, but in general, you can say JK flip-flop is uh, uh, sort of best. <laughs> DD flip-flop, probably not. Um, let's see. All right. So that's the reason why in this table, the next state is directly uh, entered as D1 and D0. Uh, isn't this sort of a counter? It is not a counter. I, I wouldn't say this is a counter. Um, I would say this is a... Uh, user-defined FSM in which the um, in which there is there is no sort of counting. Uh, it is moving from one state to the other. That's probably the only thing that is uh, it is re resembling. It's counting coins. That's right. Uh, but it is it's not counting one type of coin. Right. That there are multiple types of coins here. So it's keeping track of the money that is coming in. All right, so let's let's uh, let's talk about this. We have present state encoded, inputs exactly the same as before. Next state same as before, except now it is encoded, and we have used D1 instead of Q1 plus D0 instead of Q0 plus. Isn't it counting the state that it's in though? How is it counting? So here, what is the output of this finite state machine? It is open. That's my output. It is zero over here. It is zero over here. It is zero over here. And it is one only in 15 cents. So if I see an output of zero in which the pack of gum doesn't get released, how do you know how much money it currently has? It could be zero cents, it could be 15 cents, it could be, uh, sorry, it could be zero cents, five cents or 10 cents, right? So I wouldn't say this is counting the state, it is essentially keeping track of uh, how much money is entered by the user, zero, five, 10 and 15. And only when it goes to 15, that's when it is activating that gum release mechanism. Okay, let's see. Questions about, other questions about this?
All right, so from this, I hope that you guys are seeing state diagram was a little bit tricky, but from state diagram, things are following a pattern, right? Um, so let us uh, ask the next question here. What is the next step? Because step six is to sketch out the FSM circuit. So what do you think is our next step? K maps, okay. So using K maps, what are you trying to find? What are you using the K maps for? You guys said K maps. Mm, characteristic, you, yeah, but for what? Uh, D1 as a function of input and present state, okay. Uh, so I'm going to write just D1 or others and D0 or, okay, so I'm trying to write logic expressions, right? Logic expressions, in this case, simplest logic expressions for what? D1, D0, those are the inputs to my flip-flops, Andrew, you're right. And then I'm also doing the same thing for output open, right? So I'm going to write logic expressions for D1, D0, D open in terms of what? In terms of present state, so Q1, Q0, D and N. You guys see that? So Q1, Q0, D and N are going to be the inputs to my flip uh, K maps and the output logic expressions are going to be D1, D0 and open. So let us just take a look at how many K maps would I need and what would be the size of the K maps? Number of K maps. And the size of K maps. Output open equals Q1 and Q2. Okay, yeah, that's right. Uh, two, four input K maps. Uh, can we just jump if it's obvious? <laughs> What do you mean? Where, where do you want to jump to? Uh, like, we do we need a K map for output? Uh, not in this case, but in general, you may, right? So, uh, yes, if you don't need it, you don't have to do it. Uh, but in some cases, you may need to do it, right? Especially if the output becomes uh, like a mealy machine. In a mealy machine, uh, you most likely will need a, a, a K map even for output. All right, how many flip-flops are we doing? Two, four input, two still. All right, no, I, I, so three, I'm gonna write three, but two is absolutely necessary. Let's just leave it at that. What is the size of the K maps? Four. So the, we are doing four variable K maps and doing one for input feels like a waste. Sure, in this case. But I want to have this discussion for a general case, right? In general, you might need three, four variable K maps, but in this case, it is going to be very simple as far as the output open is concerned. You guys are absolutely on target there. All right, so let's take a look. There it is. D flip flops is going to be the easiest because of its characteristic equation. Um, Q plus equals D. So let's use a D flip flop here. We, that's our choice. We could have used toggle. We could have used JK. In this case, we are using D flip flop. We have gone through the first K map for D1, second K map for D0, and the last K map for open. And in all these three K maps, our input to the K maps were present state, Q1, Q0, inputs, dime and nickel, all of them. So we have literally taken the same state transition table here and we have entered zeros, ones and don't gets into the three K maps. Once you do the K maps, you get logic expressions. The simplest, in this case, we are doing SOP or POS.
SOP, right? So simplest, three simplest SOP logic expressions is what we are going to get. Because we are combining the ones clearly. All right, so once we get that, our last step, step number six, is going to be to implement, and in this case, we are using D flip-flops. Now, it can be a little bit tricky. It's, it's not very difficult to do this last step, but it can be a little bit tricky. Why is it tricky? Because there are lots of components to sketch. So this is sort of how I go about doing this. What I do is I, I first sketch out my flip-flops. So I know that I needed two flip-flops, so I'm gonna draw the two D flip-flops first. I'm going to name their inputs as D1 and D0, and their outputs as Q1 and Q0. Once I get that, then I'm going to use the three simplest sum of product expressions that I got from my K-maps to come up with the combinational logic that is going to be a part of this. So for example, open equals Q1 and Q0. You guys have said that. That's going to give us this. Then I have D1 equals Q1 or D or Q1 and N. Where is that? It is right here. And then of course the last one, right? The last one is for D0. Sketch out the uh, SOP, simplest SOP uh, logic diagram using the logic expression and then connect it to the D inputs, D1 and D0 for the two D flip-flops based on the three equation. Uh, that's what you have combinational logic in between output and flip-flop. That's right, that's exactly right. So this would qualify as my output logic. Output combinational logic. And all of this would qualify as my input combinational logic. I think we used um, f and g as the, the variables for those expressions when we were looking at the, the state machine structure. And clearly, you know, output open is getting two inputs. Both of them are the outputs of the flip-flops. Hence, output can only change after the negative edge of the clock in this case, because both the D flip-flops are negative edge triggered. There's no direct connection between open and D or N. By the way, uh, this slash N is a different way of writing N complement. So that's sort of the same thing as N complement. And this is Q0 complement. All right, questions about this? Draw the flip-flop first, label the flip-flops, inputs and outputs, and then using the logic expressions, draw the remaining combinational logic. And that's it. That, that's your vending machine. The N and the D are connected to the coin sensor. The output open is connected to the motor that releases the gum release mechanism, that activates the gum release mechanism. And in the middle, all you have is a bunch of combinational logic gates and flip-flops. Questions about this example? We can tie output to reset. Uh, output to reset. Right. Uh, what do you mean? The reset is over here, right? It's just making Q0 and Q1 go to 0. The, the reset, uh, active low reset is al already here to clear immediately, right? So to clear immediately, you can do that, uh, but we are, but we are not doing that. We are trying to use the the the, the uh, flip flops to to uh, to clear it after the clock edge. But yeah, to clear it immediately, you can do that. 
all right let's move forward here and talk about step five if we would have used a jk flip-flop then what would change well your present state columns don't change your inputs don't change your next state doesn't change but i cannot directly just replace q1 plus and q0 plus with d1 and d0 instead i need j1 k1 and j0 k0 i think uh, tyler pointed that out do we need this yes absolutely we need that why don't i have a column for open here why is there no open column here ideas <laughs> there's no column for open because open depends on q1 and q0 and if q1 and q0 is not changing then open doesn't change open is always going to be for this particular vending machine q1 and q0 so open column doesn't change because it depends on the present state we are doing a more machine right so because present state didn't change, um, our open is not going to change, right? So um, I didn't forget it. It was a intentional, uh, you know, uh, intentionally done so that I could ask you that, guys that question. Okay, so now from Q0, right? So let's see, from Q0 I and Q0 plus, I can get j0 and k0 what kind of table should i use to get j0 and k0 excitation table of the jk flip-flop so excitation of the jk excitation table of the jk flip-flop will tell me what should i provide at the input of the jk flip-flop so that i get this particular transition from q0 to q0 plus and in the same same way i can use q1 and q1 plus and the excitation of table of the JK flip-flop to get J1 and K1. Now, size of the K-maps and the number of K-maps. Number of K-maps. I have a feeling that you guys are going to say four. All right, fine sure oh my gosh four plus open don't forget about the open uh what is the size of the camera but you forgot <laughs> size of the k maps is also four right so four four variable k maps you know Technically, it's actually five four variable K maps considering open, but we already did that, so we don't have to do that again. But we actually need to do four new K maps J1, K1, J0, K0. Gives you what? It'll give you uh, a total of five simplest SOP expressions for J1, K1, J0, K0, and open in terms of. Q1, Q0, D, and N. Yes, it is. It may be obvious here. Not always. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's go here and take a look. All right. So that's what we did. We did four K, uh, K, uh, four four variable K maps. We did not do open because open is going to be the same as before. Q1 and Q0. And then based on the four simplest SOP expressions, we drew the input combinational logic. The output combinational logic, G did not change. Instead of two D flip-flops, we now have two JK flip-flops. So I hope you see that when we went from D to JK, did, did, did things change? Now, let's take a look here. When we did a D flip-flop implementation, apart from the two D flip-flops, 
we had eight gates, right? So we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, where is the eight? Oh, right here, eight. So we had eight gates, eight logic gates, when we did a D flip-flop implementation. But when we moved to a JK flip-flop implementation, we had one less logic gate to consider, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that brings me to the point that as you are changing your state encoding or the flip-flop choice, your cost of implementation may change. There is no perfect answer in general, but if your if your vending uh, if your finance state machine is more like a counting or counter, then toggle flip flops. And if it is counting in a uh, in a in a in a normal sequence, for example, zero one two three or uh, seven five seven six five four three, if if it is counting in you know increments of one like a standard counting, then toggle flip-flop will be the simplest. D flip-flop is going to be easy as far as filling out the transition table is concerned because of the simple characteristic equation. But in my experience, JK flip-flop has sort of been the simplest in general for most cases. One of them we, we explored just now. All right. So that was the vending machine, finance state machine discussion. Next, we move on to a complex counter design. And the only reason why it's a complex counter is because we are designing it so that it counts in binary sequence when some input M is zero. And then we can make it count in gray code when M is one. Remember what gray code is, gray code is only one bit changes at a time from one count value to the next. So for example, if you look at the gray coding here, this is zero and then only one changes and then only next one, only one bit changes, next only one bit changes and so on, right? Sort of the same uh, philosophy that we used in the design of the KMAP skeleton of the KMAP, only allowing one variable to change. So that's your gray coding. Um, so my, my, my three bit counter that I'm designing here has one input bit and that input bit is mode M. And if M is zero, I'm going to count in binary, say zero, one, two, three, all the way up to seven, and then go back to zero. And if M is one, I'm gonna count in using gray code. So zero, one, three, two, six, seven, five, four, and back to zero. That's the that, that's the counter design. So um, how 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 many states do I need for this? How many states do you guys think we need for this? Number of states, number of flip flops. Uh, what is the input? And what is the output or outputs? eight states perfect what are the eight states zero one two three four five six and seven so eight states zero through seven perfect then we have three flip-flops also right because log eight to the base two is three uh what about the input how many inputs do i have and what are they Only one, M, that's right. M is your input. Uh, what about output? How many and what are they? They are three and those are all current outputs, current flip-flop outputs. Right. So there is no, there's no, the, the, there's no combinational output combinational logic here. We are straight going from the, the, the present state of the three flip-flops is the output. Uh, T flip-flop, maybe if you had that choice, but 
as I have pointed out earlier, the process, once you get to the state diagram, is going to be the same process. State diagram to symbolic state transition table to encoded state transition table to k-maps to logic expressions to drawing a circuit, right? So there's no real point in doing the same exercise for every FSM because it's going to be the same. So what we are generally for going to focus on is from a problem statement, how do you get to a state diagram? Once you get to the state diagram, you know what the process is going to be, no matter what flip-flop you choose to do it with. You guys see that? So after state diagram is sort of this, this, the, the same thing over and over again. Uh, can we re can we create finite state machines that creates other finite state machines? Uh, I don't know. I've never thought about it that way. Uh, this is how we <laughs> well, let us try to come up with this uh, complex counter here. Um, the answer is essentially going to look like that, right? So we have got um, eight states, state zero, state one, state two, state three, state four, state five, state six, and state seven. The output is the current state, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Those are your outputs, the current outputs of the three flip-flops. You reset things, you come to state zero. After state zero, or for that matter, after you go to any state, there are two possibilities for mode bit M, zero or one. So every circle will have two arrows or arcs coming out of it, going out of it. So, so for example, if you are in state zero, mode bit one, you go to state one. Mode bit zero, you also go to the same state. And you follow this procedure down to state seven, keeping in keeping track of how are you going as far as the gray code is concerned. Because the way you do it in normal binary is essentially zero here, zero here, zero here, zero here. That is going to be you know, continuous, one after the other. As long as your mode bit is zero, you keep going down from S0 incrementally by one. But if mode bit is one, that's when you are, you are moving up and down a little bit, right? So that's the only thing that you have to keep track of. So that's your input. That is why it is going on top of your arc or arrow. Uh, what type of FSM is this? It's a Moore machine, yes. Moore machine in which, uh, let us see, Q output, let me say output equals what? Output equals present states, right? So that's, that's your um, Moore machine in which outputs are directly representing the present state one of the eight one, eight states now from this state diagram you will do all this all the all the steps right state state um, so let's talk about that let's let's take a look at how what 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 is going to be sort of your view of um, uh, the state transition table <laughs> sorry I'm going to move this out here. Uh huh. Somewhere here. All right. What I want to focus on is how does it look like? How does the state transition table look like? Earlier I said you have PS present state, you have input, you have next state, and you have output. Right. So present state. How many columns do I need for present state? How many columns do I need for present state? Uh, columns. Present state is going to be what? Q2, Q1, Q0, right? So three, three present outputs, three columns for denoting present state. Yeah? Those are the three outputs of the three flip-flops. You guys said 
we are going to need three flip flops to do this. So Q1, sorry, Q0, Q1, Q2 are the three present outputs, current outputs of the three flip flops. That's going to be my present state. Possibilities, zero through seven. What is your input? How many columns are you going to have? For input, just M, just one column for M, right? And then for next state, Q2 plus, Q1 plus, Q0 plus. Uh, and then maybe you want to do this using toggle flip-flop. If you want to do this using toggle T flip-flop, then you can have something like this. You can have uh, flip-flop inputs. What are they? T2, T1, T0. Three columns for that. Then output. Output is what? Present state equals PS. You guys see that? So for every entry, for example, this is 0, 0, 0. For every entry, how many possibilities do I need to consider? Is going a bit fast or it's sort of confusing. What is happening here? So present state is Q2, Q1, Q0. If I say state zero is represented by zero, 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 then from every present state, you are gonna have two inputs per state. M is zero, M is one, right? Based on that, you are going to figure out if it was zero and you are counting in binary, you go to one. And if you are counting in gray, you also go to one. Sure. And then Q, this is going to be zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, all the way down to one, 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 right? For each of them, you're going to have zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and so on. So as you can see, how many, if you, if now you count the, the number of rows in this table, you are going to have eight times two, 16 rows in this, right? and all those columns. All right, questions about this? Then you can use K-maps. Uh, how many K-maps would I, would I need? How many K-maps would I need and what size? If I was using toggle flip-flops number of k maps size of k maps you st you guys still want to say 3 oh my gosh say 4 for once all right <laughs> you guys don't need a just add one to whatever you want to say <laughs> All right, so we need T2, T1, T0, and output equals PS, but not in general, right? For this one, it is four K maps, and the size of the K map would also be four. Because you're writing logic expression for T2, T1, T0 output. Uh, actually, we, we are not gonna write it for output. No, we don't need it. You guys are right, we don't need it for output because it is equal to present state, right? So if I draw three flip-flops, the outputs of those three flip-flops are it. Those are the outputs. I don't need a logic expression for that. So I'm gonna need three K-maps to do this. And the size of the K-map is going to be four because I need to express them in terms of Q2, Q1, Q0, and input M. So three K-maps, four variable K-maps E three of them. Okay. Next. Our design example here is a combinational lock with two inputs, x1 and x2. 
So think of two two buttons, right? So think of two buttons, and the user has to press in a particular sequence to open the combination lock. The user has to press x1 followed by x2 followed by x2 again. Only then the combination lock is going to open. It looks like you guys are, you know, very curious to increase functionality. So I'm pretty sure at this point you are uh, wondering why are we looking at this useless combination lock? The reason is we are going to add on functionality to this. At the end of the finite state, uh, finite state machine design lecture, we are going to look at a combination lock that has an alarm functionality and it responds to multiple uh, longer sequences to open the lock and it does something when you go into an uh, alarm situation and there are ways to come out of the alarm situation but we cannot do that right away we are going to build up to that right because it's going to have a lot of states to consider but this one doesn't have too many states to consider which is why we are starting with this so if you are right now assuming that this is this is too simple yes you're absolutely right it is going to be very simple uh, but we will learn something about the the aspect of combinational logic using two inputs uh, because we can't input at every clock cycle as a human, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, it is not going to have two states. It is going to have more than two states because first I need to remember x1. Then I need to remember x1 followed by x2. Then I need to remember x1 followed by x2 followed by x2, right? So I, I need to keep track of the sequence of past inputs. So I'm going to need more than two states in this case. So let's come back to this. I will open when the user inputs or presses the buttons in that particular sequence, x1 followed by x2 followed by x2. And we are going to simplify things. We are going to assume that it the user can only input one uh, one input per clock cycles. If the user doesn't do that, we will time out. So how many uh, states do I need? Well, I can use four states to do this. And like I said, I need states because I need m more states because I'm trying to keep track of sequence of past uh, inputs. So automatically reset if you, <laughs> yes. All right, so start, right? Sort of to reset your combination lock, there is a state called start and we are giving it a name A. That's when uh, we are, uh, that's where we are starting this uh, combination lock. The user comes in and presses say X1. We go to state B from A to B. Now, there is no got x2 over here. We have not written a state called got x2 over here. Why did we not do this? Why did we not say there is a state called got x2? Because we would go back to A, that's right. So if you got x2 actually, you just go to A, right? There's We don't need to keep track of that sequence of input. Gotta press button thousand times. <laughs> well, I have a solution even for that, right? So the the uh, the lock, the security lock system that we are going to look at at the very end, the last example, is going to have a way to break that cycle as well. If you if you start pressing buttons many times, it'll it'll go to a, a alarm state, uh, and if you panic more, it'll keep alarming. <laughs> All right, so. That's why we don't have got x2, because if you really got x2, that is the same thing like you are starting things off. That's why you don't have it. But you do need to keep track of x1 followed by x2 followed by x2 again. So those are going to be my three, uh, actually four different state. Initialize or called start state. If you get x1, go to b. If you get x2 after that, go to c. If you get x2 after that, go to d. But from each state, a, b, c, or d, there are going to be two possibilities that you have to consider. 
what if the next input is x1 or what if the next input is x2. So that brings us to this state table. Let us go through this. On the left, you have state, your present state, right? So this is your present state over here. Its meaning and its name. The next is the input. Your input could be x1, x2. So those are your two inputs, right? And we are encoding that as 00, 0 means didn't press x1 or x2. 0, 01 means pressed x2. 10 means user pressed x1. 11 one means user pressed both input switches at the same time. Well, can't happen. This is the scenario I was talking about earlier. Can't happen because it is going, it, these are buttons and the user, if they attempt to press both buttons simultaneously, one may get counted before the other. So you might, depending on which gets counted before which, you may end up in either state A or B. Because if X2 gets counted, you will be in A. If X1 gets counted, you will be in B, right? So depending on which one gets counted, you might be in either A or B. And now the, 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 the designer of this combination lock may choose to take a different approach. And they may say that if the user presses both buttons that are very, very close to each other, I'm going to ignore that and stay or alarm. That's right. You can do an alarm with that. Or you can say, I'm going to ignore that and stay in my start state. I'm just going to do that. I'm not going to move forward. Now, when do you unlock? Well, you don't unlock in start. You don't unlock in got x1. You don't unlock when you get x2. You unlock only when you get x1 followed by x2 followed by x2. Uh, accidentally hit both at the same time and suddenly the lock is screaming at you. <laughs> right. Which is why we are not doing alarm. We are taking a different approach. We will just put it in state A, right? So we can just say A, A, A over here. All right. So let's talk about how this is this. Uh, state table is going to work out. Suppose you are in state A, right? That's your reset state. From state A, the user doesn't press any input. You will stay there. If the user presses X2, you will stay there. If the user presses X1, that essentially means you got X1 and you should move to state B. That's what you're doing over here. You're moving to state B over there. And then when the user tries to press both this at the same time, then that creates the ambiguity. Which one is going to get counted, A or B? That's why they are both written over here. We may, we will eventually drop this B and we will say that if that case happens, we will just count it as go back to start. Yeah, sure. Yeah, as a, as a studio, you could do it. Although it is not designed as a studio right now, but you know, uh, something that you could do in summer. Absolutely. You have, you have everything that you need to implement this. Uh, you could just mash buttons and eventually get the, <laughs> again, we are, we are, we are, you know, laying out the basics for the combination lock. This is not obviously the best one. Uh, does the FPGA board even have an alarm though? It doesn't have an alarm, but you could take one of the uh, auxiliary outputs and connect it to a small speaker. Absolutely, you can do that. So you, you can, uh, you know, connect a servo motor to this, you can connect a small fan to this, you can connect a speaker to this. You, you can connect uh, a lot of things to your FPGA board because it has a lot of uh, um, auxiliary ports by the side. They are P mods, right? So they, they, those you can push any signal, any general I/O to that to that port. Uh, let's see. Got X one. Now suppose you are in got X one. You already got X one. That is that means that you are in state B. If you are in state B, again those four possibilities occur from there. No press, X two pressed, X one press, pressed, or both pressed. In this case, if you are in B, don't press a button, you time out, you go back to A. 
If you press X2, you go to C because your, that's your second press of X2. Then if you press X1, you have essentially done X1 followed by X1, which means you go back again to state A. If you try to press both at the same time, well, one may get counted before the other. For example, A might get counted or C might get counted. Again, we can re resolve this ambiguity by, uh, you know, the designer choosing to force it to be to go to A every time that ambiguity occurs. In got X1, you do not unlock. Um, right now, are we setting this up as a Moore machine or Mealy machine? Moore is absolutely right. Unlock when you are in state D. Unlock depends on state. All right, uh, let's see. If you happen to press X1 followed by X2, you will go to state C. From state C, again, those four possibilities. Don't press any button, you time out and go to A. From state C, you press X2, good. You are in state D where you can unlock. Got the job done. If you are in state C, got X1, got X2, followed by X1 again, incorrect, go back to start. Ambiguity, both at the same time, A might get counted, D might get counted. Ambiguity can be resolved by forcing it to go to A, don't unlock. If you are in state D, what happens after that? X1 followed by X2 followed by X2. Now you get you don't press any button, you time out. You press X2 from here. Because you could have gone to A to D over here, that carries over over here, depending on which one got counted. If you press X1 after this, right? So X1, X1, X2, X2, X1. That X1 could have been a start of a new unlock situation. So you are going to treat this as the second time the user is trying to unlock and you go to state B because you have completed X1, X2, X2 and you are going back to X1. Second try, second attempt at opening it. Both press at the same time, uh, go to a start. That's in that state, state D, you will unlock the combination lock. All right, so that's your state transition table. This is a symbolic state transition table. You have got present state over here. Then you have got inputs over here. For each input, you have got all these as next states. And then you have got your output column over here. Uh, why, why dot go to, what is that? I uh, couldn't understand when you are in D hit one one when you are in D when you hit one one you are basically saying that you are, you have now unlocked it and the way you are responding to after you unlock you are one one you are forcing the user to go back to uh, the start state right uh, but you, you know there is an ambiguity there right so this could have counted as even B but we are moving towards forcing this to, to, to an A. So after this, can we minimize? Well, we, you can't really minimize after this. State A, you can encode that as zero, zero. State B, zero, one. C as one, zero. D as one, one. Uh, up to this point, there was some thinking involved. Uh, you had to think about what your state is going to look like understand how you are going to go from one to the other. Uh, but after that, uh, hardly anyone bothers anymore. <laughs> so after that, right, it's going to be turning the crank. Once you have that state assignment, it is going to be, uh, sorry, state transition table, K maps, logic expressions, sketch out the uh, FSM circuit same process as you have followed before. Uh, I don't think we need to spend time that there again and again, right? So let's take a look at the encoded state transition table over here. What we have done is to resolve that ambiguity, we have said 
every time this user presses one one or tries to do that at the same time, we are going to force the FSM to go to the start state, zero, zero, all the way. And all the other states are mapped based on the encoding, encoding A, B, C, D is zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. It's the same diagram as before. Uh, now let me ask you guys this. Uh, if I was using D flip-flops for this, if D flip-flops, um, what am I writing an equation for? How many K maps am I going to need? And how many K maps am I going to need? So size of K maps, number of K maps. Okay, so Bennett says 4K maps. Why do I need 4K maps? You guys went from, I'm going to say less than what is needed to, I'm going to say more than what is needed. <laughs> Don't you only need two D flip-flops? You are right. So you need only two D flip-flops because there is Q1 plus and Q2 plus. And because I'm using D flip-flops, that is going to be D1 and D2. Uh, sorry, D1 and D2, that's right. So the number of flip-flops are going to be, well, three or maybe two, right? Because I also need one for unlock. So if I include unlock in this, I would say the number of flip-flops, a number of K-maps are going to be three of them, right? One for uh, D1, one for D2, and one for unlock, the output. And what would be the size of the K-map? It would be four, that's right. Because you will do those X3 in terms of Q1, Q2, X1, X2, right, four. So you have got three, four variable K-maps, two flip-flops. After you do the equations, you will sketch it out. Two D flip-flops go in there first. Unlock is simply Q1 and Q2, so that goes next. And then there is this big potato, which is essentially indicating input combinational logic. F. Essentially, K maps for D1 and D0, right? That's what um, sort of identifies what logic goes over there. You guys see that? Then there is a, it's a positive edge triggered uh, uh, design, D, two D flip flops, and that's when you unlock. So a, a, a simple combinational lock example, nothing too serious happening over here. It doesn't have a lot of capability. Uh, it doesn't have a way to alarm. Uh, what, the other problem was <laughs> hack for when you're running out of time, draw potato. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> draw potato and you say these are the logic expressions that define that potato. <laughs> um, so what are you saying? Yeah, so. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, questions about this, you guys? All right, so next example that we will do is a deposit return machine. Uh, what, wait, if we actually did that, we would still get points off it. Uh, you would get points for it, yes. Maybe not the, the full points, but you would get points for that because it would, it would be right. Uh, it better, yeah, that's right. Uh, let's see, our next FSM that we are trying to design is a deposit <clears throat> deposit return machine. So let us spend a couple of minutes talking about the specifications of this deposit return machine. 
uh, it is a machine that is going to return five cents deposit on a container to the user, right? So there's a machine, it is accepting some containers from a user and every time it gets a container, it is going to give you five cents back. For every five containers that a user returns, the machine is going to dispense a quarter. So instead of uh, returning nickels, it is going to directly give you a quarter after five containers. So a different output, right? A quarter as opposed to vending a nickel. Uh, next, if the user has less than five containers, credit, for example, four containers were entered, then the user will have to press a done button and then the machine is going to dispense the correct number of nickels. So if you if the user pushes in four containers and then presses the button done, then the machine is supposed to give back four nickels. That only happens in the case of less than five containers. But if you if the user goes to five containers, they don't have to press done. They could, but they don't have to press done. They will just get a quarter back. If the done button is pressed with no containers, no coins are going to be dispensed. No way to fool this deposit return machine. All the outputs should stay on until the done button is pressed or a container is inserted. So take all of these statements into account and then we are going to start doing the step-by-step -step procedure for this. So what does the block diagram look like? You have certain inputs, you have certain outputs. You are trying to design a deposit return machine. What does it have as an input? Well, there is a CAN input sensor or a container sensor, which is essentially going to tell you the count of the number of containers sensed. Is the user pressing the done button or not? Is the user hitting the reset button to kick things off? And you also have the clock for the sequential elements inside the FSM. There are two outputs a quarter and five cents that to give uh, the change to the, uh, not the change to give uh, the deposit back to the user. Right. So that's your uh, block diagram. Next, we will tabulate all the input sequences. It's going to be very sort of uh, intuitive here, like very, very easy to go through this. No cans entered the user presses the done button, zero cents given back, nothing, no output uh, active. One can or container, then the user presses the done button. Two cans, press the done. Three cans, press done. Four cans, press done. Five, ca five cans, press done. Or five cans, don't press done, wait for the next day, uh, state, you dispense a quarter. And then go back to the zero cans state. Now the assumption that we are making over here is that the container sensor or the can sensor and done button cannot be asserted at the same time. So the user has to put in the container or the can and then press the done button, right? So th that's sort of your um, input sequences that are possible. Uh, is this going to be a melee machine? Well, so if you if you think about any sort of machine, you can make it into a Moore or a melee machine, but I believe we are trying to go for a, a Moore machine in this case. You could twist things around and make it, uh, make the output be on top of the arrows and uh, get a melee machine too. But in this one, it is how would the done immediately respond? Uh, let's take a look. Like we, we can talk about how does the done uh, take care of giving the money back. So, 
you have 10 states over here. State 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 0 through 9, those are your 10 states. Now, as you are moving from one state to the other, you are not vending any money. 0 cents, 0 cents, 0 cents and for state 4, 0 cents. But if you are in state 5, the output is a quarter. If you are in state 6, 7, 8 or 9, the output is 5 cents. So suppose we are taking, uh, you know, the approach that the user enters a can, four cans and presses the done button, right? So you start here. The user presses, uh, user enters a can or container, you go here. Another can or container, you go here. Another can or container, you go here. Another can or container, you go here, right? So, so far, you have entered four cans. It is a more. Yes, it is absolutely a more. Now, after four cans, if the user presses the done button, what happens? You go to state six, you give back five cents and you automatically at the next clock cycle go to the state seven. You give back five cents, give back five cents, give back five cents and come back to zero. You guys see that? So as you are depositing more containers, you are following this route. And then as soon as you press the done button, you are shooting off to the other side of the state table where you are only state diagram where you are only giving back money to the user five cents at a time right so if you have if, if you have operated a vending machine this is this is what you see play out right like the way it releases the change it's like one coin after the other in a in a continuous interval that is exactly what is playing out over there Go to D, go press the done button, go to six, state six, give five cents, five cents, five cents, five cents, go back to zero, right? And as it is transitioning, it is doing that without any influence or the input, right? It's, it's just doing it uh, uh, based on the active clock edge. Now, if you are in state zero from, uh, from any of the zero state, one, two, three, four state, if you press the done button from here, sorry, if you don't uh, press anything, you will just stay there, right? So for example, you are not entering any container or you are not in, uh, pressing the done button, you will do a self loop, right? Because there is no time out here. Like you don't want to time out uh, because there's not a combinational lock example. Um, so you will just stay there. If you don't do a container or the done, you will just do a self loop on one, two, three, and four. But as far as zero is concerned, if you keep pressing done, you will also stay there, no money. How do you go from one to get the money? So enter a can, press a done button, give the five cents to the user, come back to the reset state. Two cans, press done, 10 cents returned. Three cans, press done, 15 cents returned to the user. Four cans done, 20 cents returned to the user. Five cans done, followed by another can. If you press another can, you come back to one can state. Five cans, you went a quarter, and you go back all the way around to state zero. You guys see that? So C is being used to denote can or container. D is being used to denote done button being pressed by the user. Reset input is being used to, you know, start off the FSM over here. There are two forms of outputs for five cents and 15, uh, 25 cents. Now, questions about how we came up with the state diagram? for a Moore machine that does this because the next thing that we need to do is sort of the same 
uh, Q&A. How many K-maps, how many flip-flops are we going to need and all that. So how many free flops do you think we need here? Uh, four is fine. All right. Log 10 to the base 2. Seal. Seal of log 10 to the base 2. Rounding it up. That will give you 4. Okay, so we need four flip flops to do this. Um, all right, so four flip flops, right? Let's take a look here. Oh, did I do it right? Yeah. So if you're if you're gonna have four flip flops, uh, input CD. All right. Present state, PS, inputs. Next state, outputs. What do we have? Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0. You said four flip-flops. So the outputs of the four flip-flops should be Q3, Q2, Q1, Q0. You are right. It is going to be a huge table. Inputs, C, N. Uh, sorry, not C, N. C, D, right? Can and done. Next, next state, you're gonna have Q3 plus, Q2 plus, uh, Q1 plus, Q0 plus. And then if you are using the D flip-flops, then you can make those particular columns into D3, D2, D1, D0. But if you're using any other type of uh, flip-flop, then you will need four additional columns for that. Your outputs, 25 cents, five cents. So in terms of columns, you would need all of that. Uh, what is that? Zero cents? No, zero cents is not an output. Well, zero cents is no money, right? So it's not it's not really an output. We only have two outputs. We are using zero cents to identify that we are not gonna give any money back. But if you look at the picture back there, the deposit re return is sort of only two of them, five and 25. Now, let us take a look at some scenarios here. If you have 10 states, how many present state rows are you going to have? So for example, if that is your present state, there are going to be four possibilities over here, right? And then you are gonna get four here. Uh, 16. So this would be four, four rows over here. How many such rows will you have? Uh, 64. There are 10 of them, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 10. So there will be 10 times 4, right? 40. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we are not using them all, yes. So it's going to be a, a pretty huge table. Yeah, 40 rows and it looks like we have 12 columns. If we were using D flip-flops, if you we were using toggle flip-flops, it's gonna be even more than that. So we have captured that same thing into this slide. If you have got 10 states, state zero all the way to state nine, for each present state, you have got four possibilities of done or container, followed by a column for next state. When you actually do the encoded state transition table, it will correspond to four columns for Q3 plus, Q2 plus, Q1 plus, Q0 plus, and then two columns for the outputs, 25 cents and 55 cents. So if that is going to be your symbolic state table. You can come up with the encoding, a very simple encoding here, where each state is sort of being encoded by its decimal value, zero all the way to nine. 
if you and we have already answered how many flip-flops we need for this we are going to need four flip-flops to do this then you can do the design or you can use a software tool called espresso that is essentially going to do all the k-maps for you it's a very simple program it's a dos based program in which you write your logic expressions into a text file <laughs> yes it's a very very old software um, <laughs> we are not going to use espresso if you are interested let me know i can give you the software but in my opinion it is uh, it, 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 it's not of any use. Uh, it, it, so it's going to give you essentially all the, um, there's a nice one online. Sure. Use it. Um, all it gives you is the output of the K maps. Oh yeah, absolutely. You can program it in uh, Python, MATLAB, any, any software you want. Um, so if you, because the, the, because the, the number of rows and columns are so many in this case, that is the reason why you would rely on some sort of software to come up with the uh, logic expressions. Once, because you see this, if you go back here, how many k-maps are you gonna have and what is the size of the k-map? So you are going to need one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, how many, six, six variable k-maps, right? So obviously a lot of weekend projects, sure. <laughs> but time consuming, can use software to do this, such as Espresso, or you can do it in uh, uh, Python, or you can, you can do it online, whatever works. And then once you get the logic expressions, you can choose to simulate it in logic works. And if you do, these are the results. These are the results for the six logic expressions d0 d1 d2 d3 um, output for a quarter and nickel these are sort of the simplest sop expressions for them we are using d flip-flops in this case with the logic expressions you can draw things out d flip-flops are the easiest the only thing that is they are easiest is for the entry in the state transition table not easy in terms of the logic gates, right? That we are calling that as simple. So simple implementation versus easy implementation. D flip flops are easy. They are usually not simple. Um, so you can take those logic expressions, put them in logic works, and look at how your nickel and quarters, um, you know, increments. K maps are easy for computers. Chips save you money. You can you can program it. All right. So here we are right now at the end of class time. When we come back on Friday, uh, I'm going to talk about a few other examples in our finite state machine design uh, chapter. We are going to do a finite string recognizer. We are going to take a look at a little bit more advanced combinational lock, uh, a combinational lock maybe with alarm. Um, and how do you stop the alarm and how do you unlock? So we'll add more functionality and we'll take a look at a few more examples. Uh, string recognizer or st string detection um, is uh, very interesting. Um, you know, typically in uh, the exams, in the final exam, I tend to give one finite string recognition or detection uh, problem. So I hope that you guys uh, come to lecture and uh, follow along. <laughs> oh, tough crowd, man. Um, all right. So that is it for today.